Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Virtual CF Education Day, Partnering for Care. Help your respiratory and physical therapist help you thrive. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This webcast is, is hosted by the Johns Hopkins Cystic Fibrosis Center and supported through an unrestricted educational grant from Genentech. It is one in the series of webcasts called Partnering for Care. These webcasts focus on the different roles of people with cystic fibrosis, or the roles of the different healthcare professionals in the Cystic Fibrosis Center, and what you can do to help partner with them so you or your child with CF can thrive. Anyone with CF knows that it takes a team to take care of CF, whether they have CF or they know somebody with cystic fibrosis. This includes the person with the disease, their families, their friends, and the healthcare professionals at the care centers. Partnership is when a person or persons takes, take part in an activity with others. In this case, it's cystic fibrosis care. Partnering with your CF healthcare providers for CF care is important to help the person with CF thrive and help to teach them how to live their life with CF versus living their life for cystic fibrosis. This presentation will focus on how you can partner with your CF respiratory and or physical therapist so you or your child with CF can keep healthy and active. Questions for this segment came from you, the community. Questions not related to this topic or that ask for medical advice will not be asked or answered. If you have additional questions, I encourage you to talk with the respiratory or physical therapist at your CF care center. You can also contact the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation at 800-FIGHT-CF or info at cff.org. Joining me are Andrea Onesto and Karen Vonberg of the Johns Hopkins CF Center in Baltimore, Maryland. Andrea is a respiratory therapist in the pediatric clinic, and Karen is a physical therapist in both the pediatric and the adult clinics. Welcome, Andrea and Karen. So, my first question is, what is your role on the CF care team? Well, I'm one of the physical therapists in the CF clinic, and uh, part of what we do for physical therapy is airway clearance. We also um, talk about exercise, posture, pain, and urinary incontinence. And my being a physical therapist, I help do a lot of patient A physical therapist a resp or a respiratory, I'm sorry, therapist. respiratory therapist? Okay, I just want to make sure I got it right. <laughs> a respiratory therapist, I help with a lot of the uh, patient education involving uh, airway, um, inhaled medications, making sure patients are taking the right medications in the right order, that they understand their medications, um, helping them train with new medications that may be ordered, as well as doing pulmonary function tech. Uh, testing. So tell me a little bit about pulmonary function testing. What, what is it for somebody who may not know or maybe has an infant with CF? Um, pulmonary function testing is the spirometry that gives us the FEV1 and the FEC. It kind of gives us an idea of where their breathing is at that point in time and also gives us some trends on how they're doing. So might it be a way to measure the health of the airways of the lungs? It is, okay. yes. Most excellent. So Tell me, what's the difference between the respiratory and physical therapist? How would you, what are the differences? So there are definite areas where we overlap. When it comes to airway clearance, it's very center dependent, whether it's going to be a respiratory therapist or a physical therapist, or maybe even a nurse um, may do some of the education when it comes to airway clearance. But beyond that is where we kind of go our separate ways and can specialize in different things. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we, as PTs, we also look at exercise and posture and things like that. So both of you mentioned airway clearance. Tell the people watching why airway clearance is important for someone with cystic fibrosis. So airway clearance is one of the most important things that um, people with CF can do to keep their lungs healthy. Um, it's one of the main things to loosen up that mucus and clear it out of the lungs to help to preserve lung function or even improve their lung function. So a question that we got in um, during registration, um, somebody wanted to know how old should the person with CF be before they start airway clearance or physiotherapy as it's called in some countries? 
So that's a good question. And again, that's going to be center dependent. At our center, uh, we generally start very early with newborn screening um, in place in Maryland now for the last few years. We're getting patients very young. Um, they start coming to clinic usually weekly and it's um, generally at the second visit where we introduce um, airway clearance techniques in the infants. It's usually going to be modified postural drainage, percussion, and vibration. So you've talked about some definitive techniques. Tell me a little bit more about what the different techniques of airway clearance are. So the different airway clearance techniques will change. Um, Throughout the lifespan, um, they may change, you know, when someone goes off to school, they have other things that they can do. They may not have the time to coordinate with mom or dad or other caregiver to always sit down and have two people together doing postural drainage, percussion, and vibration. Um, there's also high frequency chest wall oscillation, which is where you wear a garment connected to a generator and it basically pushes the air around in the lungs, helping to loosen the mucus. Um, the different types of high frequency chest wall oscillation are the vest, the encouraged system, and the smart vest. Those are probably the three most popular. There are also devices that you blow into, the acapella, the therapep, and the flutter. These devices help to splint the airways open to get the air um, to get the air and the mucus moving better. And then there are breathing techniques, active cycle of breathing, autogenic drainage, where you're changing the type and the volume um, where you're breathing. And huffing and coughing, a forced expiratory technique and a cough should be incorporated with all of these techniques. So I have to ask probably a very common question, I'm sure you both get it a lot. Can exercise replace airway clearance? No, exercise should never replace airway clearance. Um, exercise for some people does work to get them coughing, gets them breathing hard. They may clear mucus out of their lungs while they're exercising, but it should never replace airway clearance. Um, it's very important that you work with your team if you're having trouble incorporating everything that you have to do. Um, figure out a plan, you know, work with your team to see how you're going to incorporate exercise and airway clearance. So another question that has come up is, are there any studies that highlight which method of airway clearance is better than another, or is one better than another? There are studies that look at this, and to date, really nothing is shown to be much more effective than any other technique. It's all a matter of figuring out what works best for each individual patient. So again, this is where it's really important that you work with your team. If something isn't working, or if you're not liking something, Practice the other things, you know, trial them in clinic or during an inpatient admission um, and see what's going to work best and feel best for you as well as fit into your lifestyle. So one last question on airway clearance and that is um, parents trying to manage school years, you know, is very busy. How can, any tips for fitting airway clearance in before getting somebody off to school? Again, this is a very common question, a very tricky question, and each individual is going to be different. Um, really, to, the important thing is to start young, make it part of the routine so that it's just something that happens, like brushing your teeth every morning. You're not gonna leave the house without brushing your teeth, and hopefully you're not gonna leave the house without doing your airway clearance and other medications also. Things do change, the techniques change, kids go off to school, mom and dad's work hours change. Um, there are always going to be changes, so there's no one simple answer to this. Um, it's easy enough to say set the alarm earlier, but um, it's hard to get out of bed yourself and then you get your kid out of bed on top of that. So um, there isn't an easy answer. Again, work with your team and figure out if morning isn't working, maybe it is okay to do it after school and then for your second treatment in the evening. Well, that's a good tip to always partner with your team to try and figure out how to fit it in. So, Andrea, I want to ask you a question um, related to breathing treatment. And this came in from a parent. They want to know what's the best way to give the breathing or the aerosol treatment to an infant when they're fighting or they're crying or they're trying to get the mask off. Any tips for those parents? That's a good question. And sometimes almost a tough love approach is the best thing to really do, which sounds um, a bit more difficult to do. But really, that mask treatment is the best treatment to give that child, and it's very tempting to do a blow-by treatment, but there are a lot of studies out there that show that blow-by treatment is really not an effective treatment to get the medication down into the lower parts of the airway. So, so even if the child or the infant's crying, they should leave the mask on it and just 
hold the infant. What we want to do is try to comfort the infant. Mm -hmm. So if you can swaddle, comfort your child, um, maybe pick them up, pat them, um, try to comfort them and just um, reassure them that they're safe and reassure them that this is okay and, and get them as used to the mask as you can. This is going to be a lifelong treatment for them. So the earlier you start, the better. Well, another, a little bit older, so um, another parent wrote in, wanted to know how can I make the, nebu the breathing treatments and the nebulizers more enjoyable for my, you know, preschooler, you know, it, it, they've got 20 minutes to sit there, so what can I do with them? That's a difficult <laughs> age. Again, a good question. Um, well, find something that they enjoy. I think this is a perfect time to make family time. Find something that you can do together. Play a board game. Um, read to your child. Do something to be interactive with your child if you can. I know mom and dad don't always have time. They're busy trying to cook dinner and throw on a neb treatment with the vest and, and uh, get everything done at once. Some parents choose to make this a special time for their child while they get to use um, watch a video, a special video or they get to watch TV that they don't normally get to watch. So these are all options that you can do. If your child particularly likes arts and crafts or a particular video game, you can use that as a special treat for them while they're doing a nebulizer time. But I think the key is to try and find something that they like and make the treatment as enjoyable for them as possible. It may make it a little bit more palatable for the child. So those are some great tips. Now. What about um, another question we got in? What's the order that people should do their inhaled medications? So the correct order for inhaled medications would be to start with your albuterol and then go on to hypertonic saline followed by pulmazyme and any airway clearance that you may be doing. Um, if this is your, um, not everyone's going to be prescribed these medications, but if you're prescribed these medications, this would be the correct order. And the last thing you would do is any inhaled antibiotics such as Toby or Kasten. So they do the inhaled, they do all, everything else ahead of time so the inhaled antibiotics can get as far down into the lungs as possible. Correct. Right? The, the key is to get that mucus up and out of the lungs so the inhaled antibiotics can get down into the deep parts of the lungs and work. So we've talked about order of medications. Yeah. Now I want to ask ask which nebulizer for which drug should you use? So yes. let's start at the top. Okay. Which nebulizer should you use for Pulmazyme? For Pulmazyme, you'd actually want to use the side stream nebulizer. Um, that's the suggested nebulizer for that drug. Okay, and then what about uh, the inhaled antibiotics? What about Toby? For Toby, we would want to use the, excuse me, the peri side, uh, the peri LC plus nebulizer. Okay, um, and then the last the, and a recently approved antibiotic. What about inhaled Kasten? For the Kasten, the uh, the eFlow Altera device would oh. be the recommended device for that. Now this can change from center to center, so you definitely want to talk with your respiratory therapist about the correct device to use with each inhaled medication. So we have gotten questions related to why does it take so long for my inhaled medications to go in. So if it, if it takes 20 minutes for me to do my inhaled medicine, um, is there anything I can do to shorten it? Do I need to look at my equipment? What do you tell people? Absolutely, if it's taking an, an, a longer time than normal to complete your medication regimen, we definitely need to take a look at your equipment and see what's going on there. Sometimes it's just a simple needing to change the nebulizer. Your nebulizer cup should be changed about every six months. Um, and sometimes they need to be changed a little bit quicker than that. They may break down a little bit quicker. But every six months is the recommended guideline for that. Um, and tell me, what about maintenance for the air compressor for the nebulizers? For the compressor, the compressor has a filter piece on it, and that needs to be changed out once a year. Um, so you can call your home care company or check with your CF care center to uh, change that air filter. And um, how often should they change the compressor piece? The compressor piece itself should be changed out about every five to six years. Um, we have had some instances of them needing to be changed out quicker um, if they're being used for multiple patients or anything like that. But definitely if you're noticing any breakdown um, and taking longer, then you want to talk with your respiratory therapist. So then um, somebody has to change their compressor or their filter. Who do they talk to at their center? Um, you can talk with your respiratory therapist, you can talk with your nurse. 
Um, um, and they can help you out with that. Okay, so what else is important for people with CF to do so they can get the most out of their inhaled medicines? So you want to be able to sit upright and take nice, big, deep, full breaths to fill those lungs up with your medication. So deep breaths, good posture. So yes. now, Karen, I think this one goes to you. How can yes. a physical therapist help somebody with CF with their posture? So first of all, um, it's much easier to maintain good posture than it is to correct poor posture. So early intervention is key. Um, we start looking at kids, um, you know, when they're five or six years old, and we start looking at how bendable they are, how flexible they are, are they sitting with good posture, and we're always doing education with the, the patients and the families to let them know how important good posture is. The more time we spend slouched like this, the more likely we are to, you know, quote unquote, get stuck in that position. And if you're sitting like this and your lungs can't expand well, then that's going to be one other thing working against your lungs. You already have CF working against your lungs, so sit up nice and straight. Allow those lungs to get all the air they need. Um, you know, like I said, it's easier to prevent than it is to correct, but if we do need to work on correcting poor posture, there are stretches that can be done, there's manual therapy that can be done, there's only so much we can do in the clinic, so sometimes it means a referral to an outpatient clinic for a little bit more involved physical therapy. For the physical therapy. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, since your discussion, I noticed Everyone I'm sitting up a little straighter, right? <laughs> I, have to, I have to say that. So many people um, want to know why is exercise important for CF and what's the best exercise to help with, um, not to replace, but to help with airway clearance and getting rid of or increasing pulmonary function. Sure. So the bottom line with exercise is that if you exercise regularly, you live longer. Um, not just for people with CF, but it's important for everyone out there. Exercise is going to strengthen the lungs and the heart. It's going to increase the bone and the muscle strength. It can help to prevent or minimize that poor posture that we've talked about, pain, um, the weakening or thinning of the bones, osteopenia or osteoporosis. It can also help to prevent urinary incontinence. Um, so very important to get you know, exercise in. It increases energy, um, improves quality of life, can help give you a better body image. So there are all kinds of benefits out there for exercise. Okay, now I have to say this because I always hear if people need to lose weight, they need to exercise. But people with CF need to maintain or gain weight. So Usually, they right. shouldn't not, they shouldn't exercise, right? Because they'll burn too many calories. So this is where the whole team approach comes back into play that we're not asking our patients with CF to go out there and exercise to lose weight. We're asking them to go out there for all of these other benefits that I mentioned. Um, and quite often, if people are going to be start, starting more exercise, we're also working with the dietitian to make sure they're getting the calories they need so that they're not burning too much. Um, and one parent wanted to know, what are some simple exercises for a toddler? So toddlers are fun. I mean, <laughs> that's where it's easy. Um, you know, running and chasing games are great for toddlers. Um, things like the wheelbarrow where you hold their feet up and have them walk on their arms, that's going to be great for, you know, their, their rib cage and their, their shoulders. Um, bouncing activities, trampoline, bouncing on a, a big ball or the, the hippity hops. Oh, yeah. um, there's all kinds of, of great stuff for toddlers out there. And you know, at this age, it's important that the whole family really starts to get involved, that you, you show your children that this is a part of what we do. This isn't another medicine that you have to do, you know. Um, but it's just a part of everything. Just a part life. of fun. Yeah. So you mentioned, and I want to go back to it, you mentioned urinary incontinence. Number one, what is it? Mm -hmm. And why is it? Why did you mention it in relationship to cystic fibrosis? So urinary incontinence is the involuntary leakage of urine. So pee comes out when you don't want it to come out. Um, the way that our bodies are set up, we have our bladders, um, which you can think of the bladder like a balloon, the opening being at the bottom. And underneath the bladder, you have like a, a hammock of muscles that help to support that bladder and keep that, the opening of the balloon pinched closed. When we sit on the toilet, we relax those muscles and the bladder can empty. What happens um, with stress urinary incontinence, which is common in girls and women, especially with CF, 
is that we get this um, leakage of urine because of the pressure that's going down on the bladder. The muscles are, are letting go, so to speak, and not keeping everything in when they should be keeping so everything in. So the pressure in. like when they're coughing? Pressure with a cough, a sneeze, laugh, run, jump. Um, the other thing that contributes to urinary incontinence is the posture. Again, if you want your muscles to work ideally, it's important to sit up straight so that they can function the way they're supposed to function. Once we slouch into a bad posture, those muscles are not able to keep that bladder neck closed down. So um, that's good information about urinary incontinence and exercise. What about uh, pain? I know people with CF have musculoskeletal, their muscles ache and they have pain. Can a physical therapist help? Mm -hmm. How? Um, common is to have low back pain or other joint pains. Again, posture, poor <laughs> posture can lead to these things. Um, having a physical therapist involved and doing an annual screening to try and catch any problems before they become bigger problems, before you know they, they get to be very painful. Um, specific stretching and strengthening exercises to help to relieve the pain. And again, um, as I mentioned early, re earlier, referral to outpatient physical therapy because there's only so much we can do in a busy clinic visit. The same goes for urinary incontinence. We can teach basic exercises mm -hmm. and awareness, um, but sometimes it means referral to another specialist. So if a care center doesn't have a physical or a respiratory therapist, can somebody with CF still talk to a physical or a respiratory therapist? And if so, how do they start that conversation? Or so, how do they talk to somebody? Um, so it's very center dependent. Um, if some centers have a physical therapist in clinic. Some centers may not have the PT there in clinic, but they have a contact person within the PT department at the hospital. Um, so it may be an easy referral you know, to the PT who is involved in the clinic already. Um, if you want to see a PT um, and your center does not have that contact person, you can talk with anyone on your team, the doctor, the nurse, the respiratory therapist, and try to figure out the best way to get in contact with a PT. If, if that doesn't work or if you want to do some research on your own, contacting the PT department at your center or a local private PT clinic. There's also the American Physical Therapy Association, which is the National Physical Therapy Association. They have a website which is on the slide listed here. It's APTA.org. And on that website, you can do a search based on what specialty you want and your zip code, how many miles from your zip code. So, Andrea, what about finding a respiratory therapist? The first thing I would do is start at your CF center and ask if they have any resources for finding a physical, uh, for a respiratory therapist. They may have uh, someone that they know or work with on a regular basis. If they're unable to help you, I would contact the local hospital um, closest to you's respiratory care department and they should be able to put you in touch with someone that can help you with um, any services you may need. So one last question for both of you, and that is uh, what can parents, families, and friends do to help um, maintain the health or improve the health of a person with cystic fibrosis and it thus extend their life expectancy? I think it probably starts young. It starts with the diagnosis, you know, trying to make things as fun as possible and hopefully that will improve adherence throughout the lifespan. Um, as they get older, it may become more of a challenge, but again, incorporating family time, quality time together, um, friends can encourage their friends who have CF, you know, hey, let's, let's go to the gym, let's work out together, don't you need to do your treatments first? Um, so just being there and being supportive, knowing what all the options are, you know, not all centers have every single discipline on the team there, um, but knowing to, to reach out to your team to seek out those other things to get all of the support that you need. Andrea, anything to add? Um, I agree. I think being an active force in um, the CF patient's life is very important as a friend or a family member. You need to, to encourage that patient to be um, proactive in their care, to participate in treatment, and encourage them to keep a positive attitude and keep up with their treatments, with their appointments, with everything that they need so that they become less discouraged. Well, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. thank you. Remember, being a member of your CF team is important in order to help you or your child with CF thrive and learn how to fit life
fit CF care into life versus your life into CF care. I want to encourage you to learn more by talking with your CF center respiratory or physical therapist or another member of the team. The CF Foundation website also has information under the Living with Cystic Fibrosis, Staying Healthy section. There's information on exercise and lung health. Also in the treatments under therapies, you can learn about the different therapies and nebulizers for CF care. You can also read the CF uh, care guideline related to airway clearance. However, I do want to say not all of the guidelines are available on our website due to copyright restrictions from the medical journals in which they were published. When these documents become publicly available, we will post them on the CF Foundation website. You can also learn more by searching medlineplus.gov this is an area where, um, from the National Institute of Health that has information related to disease, condition, and wellness. MoveForwardPT.com is from the uh, American uh, Physical Therapy Association, I believe that was correct, Karen. Um, and they have lots of information about exercise and keeping moving. HopkinsCF.org is the website for the Johns Hopkins Cystic Fibrosis Center. This webcast is a part of the Partnering for Care series that talks about many other topics. These topics include um, how to uh, care for your child with CF, what's it like to be an adult with CF and how to care for it as an adult, transition between pediatric and adult care, what you need to do when thinking about lung transplantation, what it means to be a CF Foundation accredited care center, how to work with your nurse, your dietitians, your social worker and psychologist to help you or your child with CF thrive. I also want to encourage you to watch an archived webcast on the Foundation's website. In the CF Lung Health Anthology, there's information about exercise and airway clearance, as well as information in navigating the hills and valleys of CF lung disease and more. Now I want to thank you for joining and watching us and submitting your questions. Andrea and Karen for answering those questions and telling us about the importance of lung health, airway clearance, exercise, oh yeah, and posture. I also want to thank Rick Vast and the technical crew, Emily Ann Powell, Melissa Chin, and the CF Foundation, and Genentech, their unrestricted educational grant, for making this webcast possible. Thank you.